there we go. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it from me. I just want to take a moment to introduce our presenters and they can go ahead and introduce themselves. Um, Lisa and Yelena will be um, presenting to us today about the redesign of business mathematics. And uh, again, thank you ladies for your time and we look very forward to it. Take it away. Hi everyone, um, I'm Lisa Koster. I'm at uh, Conestoga College and the business faculty. Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Yelena and I am also at Conestoga College. Do you want me to put up the poll? Sure. Okay. So our presentation today um, is about a math course in the degree program that uh, Lisa and I taught together, we tag teamed it um, last winter semester. And in the movement towards, or at that point, we were already at remote, during remote learning, we did a few redesigns of the course. And these redesigns were a long time coming over the few semesters beforehand, um, but then being in that remote setting really accelerated the changes that we've made. These are just some comments that students have made regarding our um, the changes. Um, we asked a reflection question in a in one of our assignments just to see how students were feeling. Um, and these were some of the comments. So it was an overall positive change that the students um, felt that they um, they felt like they gained from and also some unexpected comments. We didn't expect that students will call an assignment fun. We didn't expect them that um, some of the students said, you know, I used to do math and I just did it and I learned it and it was fine. But now through this one assignment, it was like a third case study, I understand now why this information is important. We have a poll just as we're about to start. Other than traditional tests and quizzes, have you tried other forms of assessments? So that poll should be popping up now on your Zoom. And if your answer is yes, we would like to hear what some of that is. So what have you tried? So if you can put that into the chat, we would love to hear and see some ideas throughout the session of, um, of what you tried and and maybe how it went and what the student response was. So we'll keep that open for another minute, but if you can um, keep your ideas coming through the chats, that would be really helpful to us. And we see that a lot of people have tried that have responded, so that's really great. And maybe today, if you have new ideas um, where you think that we can improve on or something that you tried, yeah, welcome to share that throughout the session. You want to just awesome. leave, we've got about uh, 20 people so far sure we can we can leave it i'll just move it off to the side of my screen here <laughs> if you've already answered you can certainly uh, read through some of these uh, comments from the students um yeah i was definitely very uh, um shocked by one student who was so excited and said you know how fun the assignment was and he learned a lot and Thank you for this assignment, which I, I think was a first, definitely, um, for me to actually have a student say thank you. <laughs> yeah, and these um, these comments, as just people know, we didn't make them up. We had a reflection question in the case study. Um, and the, so when we were doing this, the reflection case, um, question was added to the third case study. We did three of them. Um, so I thought, oh, it might be interesting to ask them a reflection question. So this was it. So that's how we have our responses. Mm -hmm. All right, should we should we um, go to the next slide, Lisa? Yeah. We can leave the poll open. And again, okay. if you've answered yes, uh, please share your idea in the chat. So for today, um, our, our idea was to talk about the motivations so that people have a context as to why these changes were made. Uh, we're going to talk about three different things mainly that we ended up doing. One was we developed a storytelling concept for the material and talk about what that means. Um, case studies that were interdependent on each other were designed. So those would be assessments through the course. And we also 
uh, made a change with respect to using a calculator in the course. We use Excel. And in light of that, um, Lisa created an OER open education resource to complement the course. The last part for today is a brainstorming session. So just to get some creative juices going on, if you're thinking about this being a good fit for your class, what could you use as a case study or, um, or an, an application that you can use in your course? Again, throughout the presentation, if you have any comments, just let us know. And I'm just gonna read comments. Lisa, you can go to the next slide. I'll read a chat comment here. Um, people said they tried open-ended assessments where they had to produce something like a blog post or video about one of the learning outcomes. Oh, so that is an interesting one. That's cool. I'm interested, yeah. That's cool. Another one, another person said weekly assignments, not straying far from traditional. Okay. And a lot of our courses have those regular assignments and the regular assignments are tied to the exam. And another person said project toward the end of the course. That's a cool idea. If you can share what project ideas you had, what that looked like, that would be really cool to know. So the motivations for the redesign. So we implemented it winter 21, um, but the changes were happening over the course of um, two or three years prior to that. So the first change um, that was made to the course was that I started learning about uh, a story concept of the idea of using stories to deliver math concepts. So when I was redesigning this degree math course for online delivery, um, I was trying to think of of how to do that. I was working with an instructional designer at Conestoga. And so this is how I've redesigned that course. So that's how it happened. So, um, so that's one piece. And then the other pieces um, that were the case studies and the OER for the Excel happened um, for winter 21. And the reasoning behind that for the case studies was the fact that we were remote. So having a traditional test wasn't as, um, uh, it was, as you know, more difficult to um, follow and proctor. So we wanted to um, get rid of some of those issues, but also we wanted to provide students with an opportunity to apply their knowledge. So, um, and also develop some research skills. So the case studies were interdependent. Now there were three in total. The first two were interdependent with each other and the last one um, was not, it was based on mortgage, was still really interesting. And the third motivation for the Excel component was that um, we wanted to move away from the calculator and start using Excel because employers were telling us or the the coordinators and the chairs in the course that um, employers were really looking for students have really strong Excel skills. And even though they were doing courses that it taught them how to use Excel, they still weren't able, uh, they weren't fluent in Excel. So that was the other motivation is to start using um, Excel in our course mm -hmm. to build that skill. Sorry, I think we skipped them. <laughs> That's okay. I know I give some extra details in each of those. But right, I know, I know. <laughs> Let's um, see what people we got said. that. So yeah, the story you talked about the storytelling concept already. So um, and um, the cases. Do you want to? Um, thank you. The the thing with the three cases is as Yelena said, they the first two were definitely connected to each other. So students had to you know complete the first one, and if for some reason they didn't or they didn't you know, they didn't do well, they could they, they could take their feedback that they received and fix it, sort of fix up that case one so that they were able to do uh, the second case. Um, uh, and so having that connection was really important. And it, it was also tied to the course story. So they had already been reading about the, you know, the, 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 the small bookstore, what was her name? Grace, right? It was Grace, yeah. Yeah, and her bookstore and things like that. And so then when they did this the case was actually tied to her bookstore and something that okay she wants to do this now uh, she went uh, she needed furniture right she was expanding and so they had to go buy it. and 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 the items that they had to do were all um 
automatically generated so everybody had different numbers so they had to have had their own thing that they had to they had to go find uh furniture and they got to pick what they wanted and but it was based on some specific um information that they were given for their case their particular case um and then in the the second second case then it's connected to that now you know what you know we had to calculate break even and the third case uh really for um was not connected to the story, but it definitely was connected to real life where they had to look for mortgages and uh, look for a home and, and calculate, make the various calculations. And, and the feedback was, as you, as you saw, was very, uh, was very interesting, especially because they realized that I love that light bulb moment where they go, oh, it's really expensive to have a house. And that was probably before all those prices started going up too. So I can only imagine what that case would generate now. <laughs> um, but they had to go and actually look for information. And, and it was fun because, you know, I think uh, they really understood what a little bit more of um, what the real world's like. And it was something that, you know, they could, it was, it was definitely, um, they could connect to the material in a way that actually they could, will be able to apply in their real life, which was really nice. So the reflection questions were very important. Um, each of the cases had a video component where they had to explain how they got the information they did, where they got it from, what, how they calculated various um, uh, results, things like that. So it, it wasn't just, you know, they had they had to be explaining it, and it was pretty evident. Um, the, the students, if they had, if they did have trouble, they it was evident that because they they couldn't explain things well, or they would try and gloss over it. Um, but majority of them really did put a lot of effort into it, and they really spent a lot of time, most of the time they went over time, if we said five minutes, they took a little longer because they wanted to explain, oh, this is where I got this number, and this is what I did here, and um, and they took a lot of pride in it, I think. Um, Ellen, do you have any other comments about the cases? I, I just found it, they were, weren't fun to mark in the sense that, you know, they took a long time, but it was really, I, I found it really, um, I got to know the um, I would say I got to know how well the students knew the work, the work and how much they work that they've invented. You, everything connected. How much, you know, their marks on these cases really did reflect what they were doing in, in on the weekly assignment or weekly quizzes and things like that. Megan, we see your hand up. Awesome. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm not sure if you're going to get to this too, but I'm sure many of the, the questions on people's minds are, um, how do you prevent the cheating? So I also use random numbers in Excel to get different things or have them get the data, produce the data. Um, but I'm still finding students are using the same Excel template and then just like putting in each other's numbers. So I really like the idea of doing the video because that's one way to catch who's actually understanding the concepts. But do you have any other safeguards for that kind of thing? I, I use the video. Um, I had the class. Um, so when we said, you know, find furniture, we gave them two different websites to go to. One group went to Ikea, another group went somewhere else. Um, so that was one thing. And then their explanations on video really helped. And I could tell sometimes they would explain like, and they did this. And I'm thinking, who's they? <laughs> there should be no they. <laughs> so, I mean, you could say I did this, but um, yeah. so that was kind of funny. So then you can kind of see, oh, okay. And then you might kind of look into that a little bit more. Um, yeah. You know, there's no complete safeguard, but we were hoping that by making it more interesting and work that they had to do, um, that they would be less likely to want to cheat. Well, and I found that the explanations, the, the, the depth of the explanations too, when they go in and say, okay, this is the formula I used and, and I put it in here and they would like, they would really get into the nitty gritty, whereas the other one would say, and then I put this here and then I did that there. And then I, you know, he'd be pointing away to, you know, you'd see the little mouse go and, and you're like, okay, so what is that? <laughs> You're not really telling me what you did. Um, I did have one student who had no clue what he was doing and, and his spreadsheet was like, and I don't think, I don't, yeah, it didn't even look right. And I, and he didn't even, I don't think he realized that the numbers didn't even make sense, um, which was really, I felt bad because it was like, oh, okay. <laughs> but at least he didn't cheat. 
um, but you're right, it's hard. The videos I think help because they have to they have to show themselves on 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 the computer on the the video, and they have to explain it. So it's a little bit, you know, um, I think it's a little bit more. Um, they, if someone else has done it, it's pretty obvious. So we have a question also along those lines. If you have a student that doesn't explain it, so we put that as part of the rubric. There were X amount of um, marks for articulation of your understanding. So we tied it still to learning outcomes, and then they would lose those points. Uh, that did happen a few times. Um, you can't, I mean, you can't, I did not report them for cheating in my case, just because I didn't see any other evidence um, that I noticed. Um, if I did, then I would have reported it. But, um, but linking it to the grade also kind of made them a little bit more serious about it. I also had them um, type out the reflection, so in words, and then tell it to me in the video as well. So it was kind of a double, um, double whammy there. Um, I didn't call it a communication mark. I, I called it um, understanding of material, something like that. And I can't remember, I think it was like five marks out of, and I can't remember the total. I can look that up. Yeah, I've added a, a case study in my uh, business one um, course. The, I haven't, it hasn't, it hasn't happened yet. So I don't exactly, I, I, hopefully it'll, it's a different type of student. Um, but in an effort to get them more engaged in the material. But one of the things is I did with my rubric, I went through um, uh, one of the courses through our teaching and learning and, and sort of had some help with developing a rubric. And so for certain key questions, I actually have marks that are based on how well they describe how they got the information. So it, you know, it might be out of, I don't know, three points or something. And if they, they, if they just do a adequate job they would get the you know a pass mark but if they do really you know they were were very thorough about how explaining how they got the particular um piece you know the, it answer then they would get a higher mark uh, taurus you have your hand up yeah i'm just going to throw a little bit of a provocation i it, when with my students i ask i've actually the calculation stuff i say i don't care how you do it if because in OneNote, there's I, I teach using OneNote. So there's a if you go to draw, there's a little math thing. So I say if you want to post the solution from from OneNote, do it to, to get quote unquote the answer, the number or whatever. But then the understanding, the questioning, the describing the meaning, asking provocative questions, I think that's the key, the explanation. Mm -hmm. Now the que the question is, are we allowed to? weight that more i saw somebody put learning outcomes understanding was taken away how do we how do we build that in more into the challenges that we give students like these are great challenges how do we build up more into those challenges rather than less so we're not focused because in the real world they're going to go and use excel and, and grab somebody else's and put the numbers in and spit but what is it what is it that you found so i think that's you're, you're right when you're saying the explanation and justify your answer is is because that's where the uniqueness and 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 the story they're being able to tell story understand the meaning I think is so how do we do that that's a that's a ch that's a challenge that's a good question Carol we see your hand up too yeah that's a Carol has a question Carol's got her hand up Carol. <laughs> I'm just going to read a couple more comments. Maybe Carol will give you some, some tech issues here. That's OK. Yeah, that's it's fine. Um, just um, a comment. It's great to introduce Excel in the scores. I believe CFA test still requires calculator use. Perhaps we should teach both. So when we did um, the course in the winter, it was a choice. It was an optional. You can use um, the calculator, or you can use Excel, just because we were um, trying to see what the student's response would be. So you could always do it that way. Um, and then in our classes, we would teach both. 
Yeah, I mean, the online, the course has, was developed with the, um, using the calculator, and that's why I did the, uh, actually, it's probably a good lead into the OER <laughs> um, and, and that kind of thing. So, oh, wrong one. Um, the, so the course itself was developed using uh, the BA2 plus calculator. Um, so what I did was I created a, a sort of a companion document uh, in Pressbooks um, with using the Excel. So, um, so basically I set it up so it matches. I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, Carol's mute is off. Carol, are you there? Oh, yes, yes. 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 Sorry, I guess, I guess my internet went down, so I didn't hear your response. I guess my comment was um, just because someone can't verbalize how they got the answer, and I know you're, we're all trying to make sure no one's cheating and so on, but people can do things and not, and they can produce it. But, and I'm just thinking of all the students we have, you know, with accessibility uh, accommodations and so on. Is this a fair thing? If it, at the end of the day, what is it that we are giving marks for or trying to make sure they can do? If someone can do the work and they're at their job and they can do the work, but they can't give a presentation and explain it, you know, how do we decide what's important? You know, it might be important to us, you know, I might think it's important that someone can explain it, but is the purpose of that because I want to make sure they're not cheating? Or is it, is, that's, those are just some thoughts that come to mind. Mm -hmm. At least for me, the motivation wasn't necessarily the cheating, although that was, you know, one, one factor. It, because I don't see the students in class, I don't know who's really understanding. And I mean, Communication, it's always that balance, right? Sometimes you have a student the other way where they can explain something verbally to you and say, yeah, I got the answer is five. I, you know, I did this number and this number and this is my answer, but they can't actually show it on paper. They can't show you the algebra. So it's, I feel like there's always that tug of war where we're trying to capture everybody, but no system is perfect. There's always going to be loops. Um, you know, where some people struggle with some skills and other people struggle with other skills. So it's a very good point to bring up because it's always going to be a balance. Definitely. I think that's part of the what, having them record it because then there was less pressure too for them to feel put on the spot. I know there are some teachers who will do interviews after a test and they'll give them a question and ask them to explain it. Um, and the same, the, the exact same scenario could occur. They could just be, they should, they could know how to do it, but not necessarily trying to explain it. Um, I always think of, you know, with my husband always says, yeah, Matthew, you should be able to do this in your head. And I'm like, no, I can do it on paper. I can't do it in my head. Like, you know, in terms of multiplication or whatever. So you're, you're right. You're, you're very right about that. So that's something to, to be aware of for sure. So, um, this is a, it's just a, the, what I, you can see with this, this is this press box, it's open, you can look at it. Um, I've connected it directly to wherever we've had, um, where we're using the BA2 plus calculator to do work on specific um, tasks. And I've connect, so I've, so I've sort of set it up so that it matches. And then we've got a link in every page in our in, uh, D2L that it'll show the BA2 plus calculator one and then I've linked it to so that they want um, to learn, learn how to do it in Excel. So what kind of formulas they can use. Um, and then I've also um, put in in each page. So here's the example. Um, this is the example right from our, our um, D2L. Then this is what we would use for Excel. And then in, what I've done is I've have almost like a, this is just a picture um, of from this like a screenshot and then they can also download the template so that they can go in and work on um, uh, questions themselves so uh, they still had to understand um, you know finding some of these <laughs> formulas but um, it just gave them uh, and, and I found I found a bunch of students who still wanted to use the BA2 plus and others who were quite happy to use Excel the interesting thing in ours that I think I did find was that in our uh, the degree program also had an Excel course um, and they were slight like I found that I 
when I would use the um, the formula or the sort of the function, I mean, I used all the the even the um, uh, the the optional ones, whereas the other teacher was teaching them without without because in our course we needed to use some of those optional pieces. So I taught them the whole thing. <laughs> so there was a little bit of sometimes I would find students were using the which was fine because it was correct, but I could see that there was, you know, a little bit of a, a an overlap, but, you know, we had to be aware of, but yeah, so it was nice because then they could go in and they would, they would, the, the question would be repeated in the, in the, in the press books, and then it would show, well, this is how you do it with Excel, and so that was, um, yeah, so that's the Excel. Um, some students I found when I asked them, at the end of the semester, I asked my students, did you use Excel? Did you use your calculator? Which one do you prefer? How did that experience go? And some people really liked Excel because they didn't have to pay extra for it. That was a big factor for some people. And then some people did both. They said, I didn't trust Excel because <laughs> there were no you know, buttons to press. So I would do it on my calculator and then I would try it on Excel. And then over time they got more and more comfortable. So we had students doing whatever fit them. And to some extent, that's nice to, to have that offering the choice, which actually brings back um, somebody in the chat mentioned that you know, sometimes people are great presenters, terrible in Excel, and so in that process, so maybe there's opportunity here to offer students choice of how they want to present, um, present their work. I know that's a whole other can of worms there, but, um, you know, just options um, that we can think about. Yeah, definitely. Any other any comments before we move on or any questions? And maybe I'll explain the story concept. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, I know I mentioned it a little bit, um, but sometimes it's kind of hard to understand how it's supposed to work. Um, I don't know if I had any. Do you anymore. have a, I think you do. I think the examples, some of the examples are in here. Yeah, which, so the um, idea was when I, so normally, you know, in your class, you would do examples to teach the material. But, you know, on Monday, you might have Sally and Bob that are um, running a business together. And then maybe the next day, um, you, you have different characters buying a car, and the examples are kind of disconnected. So the idea here is that the examples are connected to each other. So for example, I start with Grace, and she's a business owner of a bookstore. It's all fictitious information. Uh, but then at the beginning, she does some investing, uh, simple interest material. Then she does compounding interest type of investing. And then she buys a house or sorry, she doesn't buy a house. She expands her business. And so now she needs a mortgage. Um, she has some debt that she has to pay for her business throughout mm -hmm. the, the course. So that's how I intertwined it. Um, so it's not overly complicated, um, but it, does, it is time consuming at the beginning to make sure that the examples follow each other. Um, and the feedback from students was that uh, they liked that uh, because they could see how the material develops and they don't have to think in concrete, just kind of segmented like this unit and then this unit and this example, they kind of saw how everything intertwines together. And so when we did the case studies, they followed the same kind of rhythm where the first case study was merchandising, uh, mark up, mark down. And then the second case study was break even. And the data for break even was dependent on mark up and mark down questions. So that's how we tied all the concepts together. So just to give a little bit of a more details on, on how we did that. Yeah, so here's an example of, you know, Grace needs to do a renovation, so she needs to, and she's getting a loan, so, and you had to construct the amortization table schedule for that. So yeah, we tried to, you know, I, um, these were all directly connected to what was in the course, so. Um, and the other thing is, so what we were thinking would be kind of nice is to look at, you know, what are your ideas? What kinds of, you know, examples would you think of? So we had 
Grace in the bookstore and, and the, the um, first two cases related to um, buying things for her, her store. I'm teaching a, um, it's a foundations level, like it's, it's business math one, but it's for foundation students. So we, um, we, we take things a little slower in this course. And so what I decided to do is I wanted, to, I knew that markup and markdown were something they always had a hard time with getting their head wrapped around. So I thought, well, let's take it and do something somewhat sim simple. And so I had the idea of, have, of a bake sale. So students, you know, they pick a cookie recipe or they could, if they have a recipe uh, from online or if they have one of their own, they can share that, which is kind of neat. Um, and they have to get enough uh, ingredients to, to make a certain amount. And so what I did was I used the um, quiz feature and this is what we did in last year with, um, uh, with the business, the degree program, where you use the quiz feature, and we we had um, numbers get generated. So each student had a different set of numbers. So they'll have to come up with their own recipe. Then the the amount that they have to make is is automatically generated for them. And so then they have to give in a specific markup. Again, it's automatically generated, so the students don't have the same numbers. Um, then they have to calculate the selling price, and then at the end of the day, they have to do some discounting because they have some left and they want to sell the rest away, rest at the rest. And at the end, they have to calculate the profit. So they can use, and in my case, because they're not necessarily using Excel, they don't, even though they take an Excel course, I'm not making them use Excel because some of them, if they've happened to have failed the course and they're taking it over, I don't want them, they can do this all on paper if they want. Um, they can put it in Word, whatever, whatever, as long as they show their calculations, I'm, you know, trying to be as flexible as possible that way. Um, and then the same sort of thing, we'll do a video where they they should present their solution and, and their answers. And they ha I have some very specific reflection questions designed to, so not so much as a I, you know, I used three times five equals, you know, what, whatever it more about interpreting the information that they found and what would happen if the cost of the table was more, what would happen if this, if there was a change in this particular cost. Um, and just so that they can sort of think through what would happen at the end of the day. And that sets them up also for the, for the break even, you know, because now they've, they've made a $300 because it's supposed to be for a charity, right? Um, if they made $300, well, what would happen if they had to pay more for the, you know, $50 more for the table? Well, now, so they have to interpret that. So that's kind of what I did for this. So we'll see how it goes because they're a different type of student. Um, and I'm hoping that this helps them get engaged. So the link, Yelena put the link into the, um, it's, just a, it's just a Padlet. And I put my case there already, so you can see, just so you can. So I was hope, we were hoping that maybe we can brainstorm some other types of, you know, some, what are the topics in business math and what kind of a case, case could you do that maybe, maybe students could then show what they know with not, what's not necessarily in a testing environment. Um, maybe perhaps the person, and I have to go back and look, who has the project at the end of the semester, what, you know, what, what did they do, that kind of thing. And they said, should we do this in a breakout room? Do you want to, would people want that to break off into maybe groups of three or so, and then brainstorm some ideas? Well, we could do that. Can we get a thumbs up if people are interested in that? Would it, would, would it be easier to get into a room? Oh, there we go. <laughs> I already got one in there. Look, choose a dream car. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I like that. So Lauren's in there. So that, and that's cool because that sort of goes with the, you know, the whole idea of getting the house, but instead of, you know, doing the dream car is great. Yeah. And that's a good one too, because they can make up, make their own car right now. Websites, when you go to yes. uh, car dealerships, you can put in whatever, mm -hmm you want on there spoilers this that you can make the car your own and then how much is it going to cost you so if anybody's not used pilot there's a little button on the on the bottom right hand side that's a plus there's a plus when you click on that it'll pop open and you can type in you know what say what the subject is and then you can write something um too and then just and then when you're done you just hit publish oh and that's what we talked about oops well, that's my picture. <laughs> what 
else did we say? We said break even, right? We were talking about this earlier. We could take the idea of the bake, you know, the, the bake sale um, and, and perhaps extend it to, um, you know, break even analysis and make it almost Megan? like a second one. Hey again. Yep. Sorry. No, <laughs> um, this great. is right up, right up my alley, exactly the stuff that I'm teaching and what I've been trying to do with my classes too. So I really appreciate this conversation. But how have you found, because I've been trying to incorporate Excel into business math, we use or financial math more so our second semester course. Um, but we use the BA2 plus and I've been really having a hard time juggling the time in able to do both. So I've been using the Excel as sort of like self study assignments. Um, where here, here's the resources, figure it out, try to use Excel. It's, it's a little clunky and isn't working very well. Um, so how are you finding the time to be able to teach both? Um, I know for myself, um, the course that we had was because it's all developed, they sort of, they would could go through some of the, the content where talked about the BA2 plus, and then I would do like a tutorial where I would show them how to use the Excel and in, in its place. You know, okay, so here's, you've, you see how we do, you know, what buttons to press in it and on the BA2 plus, let's do that question with Excel. And, and sort of that's sort of how I've, I approached it. You know, not, yeah, Elena probably might've done it differently. And how many hours a week do you see your students? Well, that course was what four it was well we were online so we were doing i was doing two hours synchronous yep. live session okay so i see them three hours a week and that's it so there's no extra tutorial or anything like that so three credit course three hour class once a week um and i'm barely getting through what i need to get through to to meet those requirements and to do those examples um, have you found students are also, sorry, I'm monopolizing questions here. Um, have you found students were struggling with the multiple modes of solving? Were they like, ah, that's too much information or did they appreciate that extra layer? I kind of did a, a mix. Most of my students prefer the calculator. So for most of the time I was doing the calculator and then I would say, and once we got comfortable, um, then I focused more on Excel and I said, oh, by the way, you can also do this in Excel here, you know, and then I try to connect the variables from the calculator to Excel. Um, if I was to do it again, something like videos could help, like how to use the calculator for the date function, how to use the calculator for, you know, so that they, I mean, they don't need to do that with you. They need to see it, but you don't need to be there with them. Um, I, you know, that's the, the theoretical idea. Um, so that's something you could do too is, although that's now more work, um, just a different kind of work. But um, yeah, you can go, go about it that way. Yeah, and in my case, I, I, I sort of treated it as hybrid because we did have content already developed for a fully online course. What I would do is as part of their pre-work where they would work through some of the material online so that I could then extend it and, and use the, the Excel. I guess I used Excel a lot for them for whenever, like for the sections that were, were more complicated. And I had a lot of them using Excel, especially on the final exam, they were uploading their Excel spreadsheets and um, I had a lot more doing Excel. So I guess a lot of it depends on what you focus on um, because yeah, if you focus more on Excel, they'll they'll do the Excel. If they focus more on um, the BA2 plus or the calculator, they'll do that. So some things that I've found save time is when I'm teaching, I have um, kind of the template set up. So I have a grid for all of my variables. So N, I, Y, P, V, future values. So I'm not spending time writing that out for every question. Yeah. Um, and that found that saves time. So then I would say, okay, so if you're using the calculator, these are your variables. If you're using the Excel, these are your variables, but it's all on one screen. So students can kind of see the difference between the two set up as a table. Carol, we see your hand up. Yeah, and um, you showed this quickly, Lisa. So when you showed the press book, 
-hmm. like are the students creating the template or is it are they downloading the template and then just filling in the variables yeah they could download the template and, and they yeah but so, they still have to understand that you know the difference between j and i and things like that so there's i fit you know they there was still and the they still would have to go uh yeah they would still have to understand um I'm trying to think well, it's just like the calculator you don't yeah. have your variables you put them in yeah so, so like if they understand that you know j i it, it's just a different mode like it's yeah. really they're not like are they learning excel or are they just using excel like they're using the calculator is my question i would say the latter the, the, the latter right because I've, you know, I go through and we tell them this is what the this is the function you need to use. These are the variables that are in that function, and you need to put the the variables in it, you know, appropriately. Just like that, yeah. So they're using it like the calculator, and they're not meant, you know, that we don't say, oh, go find the payment and use it. Um, I think now whether or not we wanted to move to another, like, you know, move that towards having them learn more. I don't know, but I think the idea was they just learn how to use Excel to use those functions. Thank you. Yeah, because Excel, question. yeah, that is a good question because Excel is not part of the learning outcomes. Yeah. So they're not, as part of the learning outcomes, they're not asked to know how to use Excel. They have a course for that. Um, but now it's using Excel as the tool. Yeah. Just like the calculator is a tool. Yeah, so that's why the templates are there so that they, you know, but most most students could you, you could see they would make the exact same error that they might using the calculator or using a formula. Um, so yeah, it's just the tool. <laughs> yeah, and Question. the benefit is that if if Excel is something that's used in the program and they're expected to know this, that it improves fami familiarity with using Excel because a lot of times, as soon as students see Excel, they're like, oh. They're good at texting each other. They're good at all of that kind of techy stuff. But when it comes to actually using the software programs, they struggle with that. Even just navigating cells, putting it in an equal sign into the cell for calculations, they struggle with that. Yeah. Any other thoughts or questions? seeing anything in the chat there's a new padlet idea for mathematical errors i like that yeah 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 so find the error yeah and that i did that for a review class last week and it's a totally different way of students processing the information because they're used to okay tell me the answer but now they have to understand the process and they were all looking for calculation errors. So if I had one times two equals five, they were able to circle that because they knew that was a mistake, but they weren't as um, able to quickly identify the process and where the error was in the process of the problem, not just the calculations themselves. It's a really good, good idea there too. Yeah, definitely. I like the idea too that it's you know you're looking at you know sales brochures or marketing materials and things like that because then it's again it's connecting that real world um something that they would see and it enables them to start thinking about when they see numbers or they see things you know i always when i teach the foundational class and we talk about you know i i, I remember going taking pictures at, at the grocery store and saying okay which one's the better buy because it was just it was all about unit pricing but sometimes they don't they didn't quite get it so this was like okay let's look at when you you have these two signs for the same product which one's the better buy and so they'd have to figure that out and 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 that identified when they mixed up the way they did the unit pricing so that was you know what's so it was kind of neat i like that but that's not really a case study but it was certainly real life real world Oh, there's a Look. good example that came through the pilot. Do you see it? Um, cost comparison of renting versus buying. Yeah. And that's like real world stuff. I have. It. Yeah, some comments that came when I did the mortgage. So they had to um, find a house on MLS, determine what the current interest rates are, 
um, they had to find a job that can get them that income. So we had a, a debt ratio service ratio that we were using to help them with that. And then they, like some of them came back with, wow, this is really interesting and you know, blah, blah, blah. And others came back with, wow, I'm never going to be able to afford a house. I'm gonna live at home forever. <laughs> this is what they wrote to us. They're telling us this in the video and they're very you know, upset about it. So you know, you're trying to you know, inspire them a little bit, but yeah, they, they didn't know that you can look up property taxes or that that's even a thing to consider when you're buying a house or heating yeah. expenses. They're just like, I just thought it was the asking price, I, you know? Um, so yeah, so it was a really, really interesting one. Um, yeah, and then renting versus buying, especially now with the housing crisis, that might be really relevant to students now. That's a good one. Good idea. I like that. <laughs> Not seeing any other questions. Are there any other thoughts or questions? I can leave the Padlet up and continue to share. <laughs> Hi, I'm back. Thank you so much. I was just I'm listening and watching. So I think, um, yes, absolutely leave it up if anybody else wants to add anything else in. I just want to remind everyone that we will be sharing the recording as well as the um, slides and we'll be putting those on the OCMA site um, once the conference is done. Uh, and of course, you can reach out to Lisa and Yelena if you have any questions that pop up into your mind afterwards. Um, but absolutely, thank you so much, ladies. This was very interesting um, and very informative. I think we're touching on a lot of things that, that people are doing and thinking about. Um, so that's very important. Um, if anyone has anything last minute they want to share, uh, either by sharing your video, and by all means, you guys can share your videos and say hi right now if you want. I always love to see people. Um, then, then please do so. Uh, otherwise, we can... Uh, we have just a few minutes before noon. Um, we are taking the break from 12 till one, it's lunch break. And then at one o'clock we have our keynote uh, with the video Bagdasar who's joining us from the UK. A uh, very interesting talk that we'll hear from him. And then we have our last uh, session, which is with Natalia at three to four and that's around randomized assessment. Um, so that will conclude our day one of the conference. So I'm not seeing any hands or anything in the chat. So I'm going to wish everyone, hi, Craig. Good to see you. <laughs> I always love that background. Um, I'm going to, uh, yep, thank you. Thank you as well. Going to wish everyone a good lunch hour. And uh, we will see you at the keynote uh, session starting in uh, just a little over an hour. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Hi, Shob. Take care, guys. We'll see you. Did you stop the recording? <laughs> I'll stop yeah. it. Oh, did you? Okay.